Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone back this afternoon to our worship. If you would be turning your Bibles this afternoon to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're going to read a short verse there just in a moment. And we're going to be talking about our attitudes. All of us have attitudes, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But we're going to talk specifically about a particular attitude, and that's the attitude that we're to have when we're here worshiping God. Because even at those times in worship, our attitude may be good or it may be bad. So we have to determine in our own heart the kind of attitude we're going to have for worship. And we should have the proper attitude when we are here. As we say on a regular basis, we're here to worship God. It's not us being here to entertain ourselves, entertain one another, or to feel good about everything. It's not a touchy-feely type of attitude we should have. We should have that of reverence and soberness as we come before our almighty God in heaven. Because he is our creator. He sustains our life as we live here upon this earth. And as we live here, we're to give him honor and respect, glory for being the creator of all things. And today in this particular lesson, I want to look at some principles of scripture that will help us examine the kind of attitudes that we should have when we come to the, to the worship each Lord's day. I know one of our objectives should be in our own personal lives is that we should examine our own hearts to make sure that our attitude is proper during worship. We live in a world today full of electronics, modern technology, and it's all great to an extent, but it can also be a hindrance to us as well. And so we have to make sure that even with the things that we have today, that can easily cause our minds to wander, to cause us to reflect upon other things, the reason that we're here. And we need to realize that our reason for being here is to worship God. In John 4, 24, the Bible teaches us as we read that passage that God is a spirit. Literally, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You think about this text, Jesus is speaking about worship and the proper attitude when it comes to worship. The proper worship occurs when it is done both in spirit and in truth. We worship according to the truth because we are to conduct ourselves according to truth and that is the right action that must be involved in worship. And then when we worship according to spirit, we're worshiping with the right attitude. So when we think about it in that particular passage, we're looking at action and attitude when it comes to our worship. Our action has to be according to truth. The attitude has to be in spirit, in a spiritual manner that we're thinking and conducting ourselves accordingly that we can give God what he deserves as our creator. So I want to talk for a few moments about our attitude in worship. For us to have the right attitude in worship, we must ask ourselves some questions. The very first question I want to ask ourselves is, why am I here? You might ask yourself that, why am I here right now? I hope you're here to worship God in spirit and in truth. That's the reason we should be here. This is a question of purpose. There's a purpose for us being here. But there are a lot of purposes that people have in their own minds or in their own hearts and it may not be the right purpose. Some purposes are, some kids say, well, mom and daddy made me come or parents made me come here. They may not want to be here, but mom and daddy made me come here. I've heard that over the years. That's the only reason some kids were in worship. Some come to worship to feel good about themselves. 
There's nothing wrong with feeling good about yourselves. But what is the main reason for being here? Not to feel good about yourself, but to worship God. But when we engage in worship to God and we're fellowshipping one another, it should make us feel good about ourselves. But feeling good about ourselves alone is not the reason we're here. There are some religions, some churches that it's a feel-good religion. And the people come to feel good about themselves. Well, when you leave here, you should feel good about yourself if you're doing what's right. Not to be entertained, not for some so-called Christian rock concert that some churches have or just some play that somebody wants to put on, but worshiping God in spirit and in truth according to what the doctrine of the New Testament teaches us. That's how we'll feel good about ourselves, doing what the Bible teaches. Some come to socialize. Years ago when I was preaching in Alabama, I had a, there was a family that came. I became good friends with them. They were older, just pretty close to mom and dad's age. And I got to know the guy. He was a down-to-earth kind of guy. And I, I went to visit him to have a study with him. And basically he said, hey, I'm not, not really there to hear. He said, I, I'll listen to you preach. You, you you have some good lessons I can listen to, but he said, I'm really there because I like some of the people here. I want to visit with everybody here. So he was there to socialize. That's the wrong attitude. Now, there can be socialization before and after, and it should be. We should be able to visit and talk with one another, but that's not why we're here. That's an added bonus after everything's over with, maybe. But we're not here just to socialize. There are some that their purpose of being in worship is just to be with their family. I really don't care why I'm here. I just want to be with my family. I want to see my family. But the purpose of the attitude to worship God's not there. And some are there to catch up with the latest news or maybe the latest gossip. <laughs> they just want to see what's going on. Well, that's not why we should be here either. What should be our purpose? Well, we worship God because he is worthy of our worship. In Psalm 18, verse 3, we can read, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. That's a song that we sing to the youth sometime. And it's based right here in the scripture. We do call upon the Lord. We do come to worship God because he is worthy. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. For the Lord's pleasure these things were created, not for our pleasure, but God is worthy. Worthy to receive glory and honor and power. 1 Chronicles 16.29 and Psalm 29.2 Say the same thing. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. What should be our frame of mind when we're coming to worship God? It should be that of holiness. That we're here because God is holy. We also come to worship because we love God. If we come to worship and we don't love God, then... <laughs> There's a major problem there. But I know that most of us, I would hope all of us here, but most people who are attending worship should come because they love God. When we love someone, we want to give them our full attention, don't we? And that's definitely true of God. And we give our full attention to the worship of God on this Lord's day. Now, that love doesn't stop when we leave the building either. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if we love God, we're going to keep the commandments of God. That's not just here. That's every day that we live here upon this earth. In Matthew 22, 37, we can read, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is at least includes worship, but it also includes our daily living. There are many other reasons that we should worship God. 
because he loves us. John 3, 16, passage familiar to us all, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We remember the love of God for us that he sent his son to die for us. That, at the very least, should prompt us to want to do what is right and to live right. We also worship God because God is holy. Psalm 99.5, Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. We worship God because he is good. Luke 18.19 says, There's none good save one, that is God. We also worship God because God is true. He has given the truth through His Son, Jesus Christ. We have the truth in written word through the divine writers of the New Testament. So we know that God is good and God is truth. God is also righteousness and God is just. And we need to know that we do serve a loving and a just God. But with that just, His justness comes justice. And we want to receive more of that mercy than justice because justice is getting what we deserve and we deserve hell. But His mercy allows us that home in heaven as we live a faithful life and serve Him. These are all scriptural reasons that we worship God. And we need to reflect on those not only as we're going through this lesson right now, but we reflect on those each day that we live here upon this earth, realizing what God has done for us, the blessings He's given us, particularly through His Son, Jesus Christ, the blessing of salvation because of His death on the cross, His burial in the tomb, particularly His resurrection from the grave that allows this to be possible. But then what's the result? What are the results from our worship? The result from our worship is, first of all, we get to hear God's Word proclaimed. We get to study God's Word. We get to know what God wants us to do through that study. We have fellowship. Part of the worship is fellowship. We're fellowshipping one another. When we're singing songs, we're singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and singing, making melody in our heart to the Lord. And in doing so, that we're edifying one another as we're offering praise and worship to God. Now, our worship is directed to God, but in doing such, we have the fellowship one with another. We're living a Christian life. We're serving God faithfully. There's that fellowship with each other and fellowship with God. And as we blend our voices together in worshiping God in song, and we're going to get to these just in a moment, a little bit more detail, then this gives us even more of that fellowship. We will also enhance our relationship with God because as we worship Him and as we're doing His will, that does help us grow closer to God. In James chapter 4, he says, Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye you double-minded. If we draw nigh to God, we draw closer to God, and that's done in our worship, but it's also done in our Christian life, he will draw closer to us. And that's what we crave and desire in our lives, or should, so that we can be in heaven together. We can't expect blessings of worship without the proper attitude of worship. And that's something we need to remember. Secondly, how can I improve my attitude in worship? How can I improve my attitude in worship? This is a matter of focus. It's hard to focus sometimes. I'll admit it, it's hard to focus. Sometimes I'll hear David saying something and my mind gets wondering on something he said. It is, I kind of run rabbits in my head. I'm thinking something related to what he's saying. And I have to pull myself back in and say, oh, I can think about that later. Right now, we've got to focus on why we're here. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I know probably everybody at one time or another has done that. It's easy to do that if, if you allow it. So we have to focus and pay attention to what's being said. Listen to the message 
And then it helps us even more as we grow. So there are some pertinent questions with this. When worship is completed, do we understand what we've just done? I mean, we should because we're here. But if we don't focus on the worship, we don't focus on the lesson, we don't focus on the prayers. Matter of fact, I was, as Eric was saying the prayer just a minute ago, thinking, boy, he's hitting on a lesson here, he's hitting on a lesson here. I was going over that in my mind because he was saying exactly what I'm preaching right now. We focus on all of it. We think about what's being said in the prayer. We think about what's being done in the worship. Are we focusing on the leaders of worship or are we focusing on the message? No matter how good the speaker may be or how bad the speaker may be, we focus on the message, folks. And I say bad is never a bad message if it's God's truth. But that's the way people view it. And we shouldn't view things that way. When the word of God is being taught to us in its truth, then we need to be paying attention to that and understanding that we're hearing God's word. We don't focus on who's doing it. We focus on what's being said. It's the message that we're here to hear. Do our own thoughts reflect upon what's going on in worship? That's another question we have to ask ourselves. Again, it goes back to the focus. We're going to have the right attitude in worship. We also have to have the right focus in worship. So let's look at some of the things that we do in worship. Singing. Are we actively participating in the singing? I mentioned Ephesians 5.19. I didn't give you the, the reference, but speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, that verse tells us. We're to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. That requires focus, understanding and knowing what we're doing and why we're doing it and looking at the words that we're singing. We have to pay attention to some of the songs. There are songs in the songbook that are not scriptural. Some of the words they have in there are just not right. They're not biblically correct. And we have to remember that these songs that we sing are written by men. And men are imperfect. So we have to pay attention to what we're singing. We have to pay attention to those words. Or else we will sing something that's false. Now, I've been part of congregations in the past that they sang some songs and I, had to, I got up and preached sermons about the songs and they got mad at me because they liked the song. They'd rather sing something false than listen to what is being said about that song and an, an exegesis of the words of that song and even pointing out biblically this phrase or this word or this whole song is wrong. We shouldn't be singing it. And then for someone to come back and say, well, we're going to sing it anyway because we like it. Now, what kind of attitude is that? When we point out something is not right, do we keep on doing what is wrong just because we like it? Or do we change our attitude and do what is right? That's what we should do. We should change our attitude. So we have to know what we're singing. In Colossians 3.16, it tells us basically the same thing as Ephesians 5.19, but toward the end of that, it says, Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We need to sing the grace in our hearts. We need to understand what we are doing. Psalm 47.4 says, For God is a king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. Do we understand what we're singing? We should. It's very important. Because 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. We have to sing with the right attitude, but we also have to have that understanding. That goes back to almost to John 4, 24, where everything has to be done in spirit and in truth. In spirit and understanding. We have to have the understanding of what the truth teaches and follow that. Another thing we do in our worship is prayer. And we should be focused upon the words being prayed in our own minds. When that person is up leading the prayer, whatever he's saying, we should be thinking about in our minds. He's saying this. He is leading the congregation in prayer. 
And it's a prayer for all of us. And we should be participating in that. We're not saying the words with them or we're not echoing something in our own mind. We're listening to what's being said intently so we'll know what's being prayed. Again, another part of 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, I will pray with the understanding. So we need to pray with the understanding. Prayer should exercise faith. Mark eleven twenty four, we can read, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. We need to pray in faith. James chapter 1 tells us if we don't ask in faith, we're like a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. In other words, when we pray, we should have the faith that God's going to answer those prayers. Now, God's going to answer our prayers if we're faithful. But he may not always answer those prayers like we want them answered. He's going to answer them according to his will and what he knows is best for us. We may pray for something and we don't get it. We say, God didn't answer my prayers. Have you ever thought God answered the prayers and said No. He's not going to come in some little small voice and say, no, you're not going to get this. But when you know that it's not going like you want it to go after you prayed something, have you ever thought that maybe God's saying no to you? You ever tell your kids no, parents? Have you ever told your kids no? Some people don't, but most of us do. They don't always get what they want. We don't always get what we want. We have to pray in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavered is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Again, James chapter 1 teaches us this. Do we delight in the word of the Lord? Psalm 1, 2 tells us, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both day and night. We should be meditating on God's word day and night, and our delight should be in God's word. Romans seven twenty two. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Then we come to giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7 says, I say, If you spoke so sparingly, you'll also reap sparingly. So bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. But so let us give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God love the cheerful giver. We had a great contribution last week. And I commend everyone here for that. I think people went above and beyond, especially after Christmas. I know David mentioned it and Ken's sermon last week mentioned it. And I think that was great that we realize we can reach deep down and we can do more. And that's something that we all think about in our lives. In 2 Corinthians 8, 5, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. We can do it whether it's giving monetarily or as with this passage in 2 Corinthians 8, we give ourselves unto God in our service to Him. And then there's the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, we won't read the passage, verses 23 through 28, if I can get it out correctly, that we are to take the Lord's Supper and we're to do so with the proper frame of mind with the right attitude. So there's an attitude when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper. We're not thinking about the ball game, the pot roast that may be on uh, simmering, waiting on you to get home, or what restaurant you're going to go out to eat. So there are things that we have to think about. We're centered on the reason that we're here. And on the Lord's Supper, we're centered upon the death of Christ on the cross and the blood that was shed for us. That's what we do in partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine. But then next, what are the results of our attitude? This is a question of behavior. If we act wrong, then our worship's going to be in vain. And then our worship wouldn't be any better than that of the Pharisees. When Jesus said concerning them in Matthew 15, 9, In vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. But God rewards those who diligently seek him, Hebrews eleven six. If we act wrong, we have spiritual sickness, and it will detract from our own spiritual growth. We won't be growing like we should. In 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2, it says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice 
and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. We should crave and desire God's word that we can grow. And as newborn babes, people who are new Christians, they start off on the milk, on basics, to learn God's word. And they grow and continue to grow. And as we mature, then we can handle the meat of God's word and continue to grow. The bottom line is that God will be displeased with us if we don't do his will. He's going to be displeased with us if we fail to worship him with the right attitude and worship him according to truth. We shouldn't deceive ourselves into thinking that we can talk, write notes, goof around or goof off and play around during worship and think that it's all fun and games because that's not why we're here. God knows what we're doing. And a lot of other people, I ain't going to say everybody knows because some people are still oblivious, but a lot of people can see that when you're goofing off or writing notes or playing on your phone or whatever and not paying attention to what's going on. We don't need to be deceived by having the wrong kind of attitude in worship. But I hope and pray that in this lesson we can understand properly to have the right purpose the right focus, and the right behavior that will help us increase not only our attitude in worship ourselves, but increase our love toward God even more as we intently worship God that we're focusing with the right attitude and the right purpose and the right behavior in the worship. And we will grow closer to God, closer to one another, and closer to heaven when we leave this life. As a Christian, if you have fallen away or you're not living like you should, maybe you don't have the right attitude in worship, but maybe it could be something else. In your life, if you sin, then we're going to extend the invitation for you to give you that opportunity to make changes, to turn away from sin, repent of those things, to have the right attitude, not just in worship, but the right attitude in life so that heaven can be your home. If you're here and you're not a child of God, you've never rendered obedience to the gospel of Christ, you can come today obeying the gospel. If you believe Jesus Christ is God's Son and you're willing to change your life in repentance, you can confess Jesus with a mouth and will immerse you in baptism for the remission of your sins so that you can be saved by the precious blood of Jesus, become a new creature in Christ, start a new life in your service with Him, and ultimately having heaven as your home when this life is over. If you are subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, we urge you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing.